Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, so this is video two of the tutorial. So in video one, I gave a basic overview as to what the tutorial is going to be about. Uh, so in particular, I, what I said was we're going to be introducing this, this hierarchy of permissionlessness. Okay, so we have four different settings starting from the, the most permissionless down to the least permissionless. Okay, it's the fully permissionless setting at the top with the permission setting at the bottom. Uh, so what we're going to be doing in, in this video is going to start um, introducing the, the fully permissionless setting. Okay. As I said last time though, uh, so generally if we're talking about permissionless protocols, then we're, we're going to want to consider uh, what we'll call resources of some kind. Okay? So resources are things like you know, ASICs, memory chips, uh, stake, etc. Just to begin with though, I want to introduce first of all a version of the fully permissionless setting in which we don't yet get to talk about resources. Okay, so we'll introduce the fully permissionless setting without resources, uh, and then we'll introduce the resources later on. Okay, and then as we move from the permission setting to the permissionless setting, uh, actually what happens is that we introduce three new challenges all at once, okay, and as, as detailed on this slide here. Okay, so we introduce these three new challenges. So this, is what, this is what they are. So first of all, uh, the set of distinct entities running the protocol is now unknown and of unknown size. Okay, obviously that's not the case in the permission setting. We have a, a fixed set of known participants. But now the set of uh, the, the, the people running the protocol, uh, right, we, we don't know who they are, we don't know how many there are. That's the first new challenge. Second challenge is that the entities running the protocol can now start or stop running the protocol at any time. Okay, they can be active, then inactive, then active again, and so on. Okay, that's the second challenge. And then a third and distinct challenge is that now we have to deal with the possibility of civil attacks. Okay, <clears throat> each such entity can operate the protocol using an unknown and unbounded number of identifiers. Okay, so we introduced these these three new challenges simultaneously, uh, which generally I guess might seem like a slightly sort of uh, mad thing to do. But generally, theoretically speaking, uh, <clears throat> what you do, uh, you know, if you want to develop the theories, you introduce one new challenge at a time, right? You introduce one new challenge, uh, see what that changes, then you introduce a second new challenge and see what that changes and so on. The reason that we uh, we do this, we introduce three new challenges simultaneously now, is uh, that we have a change in, in motivation, right? So, uh, whereas previously, you know, with, with, when we're talking in the, in the permission uh, setting, the aim is to deal with like fault tolerance, now our aim is, uh, is decentralization, okay? And it seems that, you know, uh, uh, dealing with decentralization requires us to uh, consider these these three new challenges at once. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I should make it clear that I'm, I'm not going to attempt to formally define what we mean by decentralization here. Um, so we, we're trying to formally define what we mean by a permissionless protocol, by the permissionless setting, but we're leading uh, decentralization as a, as a vaguely sort of vague term. I'm just observing that... Um, if we want to work uh, with in a decentralized uh, with decentralized protocols, then it seems that we have to deal with these these three new challenges. Uh, yeah, so we introduced these three new challenges simultaneously. It is going to be interesting though when we consider impossibility results. It's going to be interesting to analyze uh, which of these three new uh, challenges is really driving the new impossibility result. Right? So is it really the, fact, uh, the case that we need all three new challenges in order to have a new impossibility result, or is it really only one of these challenges which, in particular, is driving the new impossibility result? Okay, um, so yeah, so we introduced these three new challenges. Uh, what I just there was at quite a high level, so now what I'm going to do is just say the same thing again, but in a slightly more precise way. Okay, again, in this tutorial, I'm going to think, keep things at a, a fairly high level. Okay, so I'm not going to be completely precise. If you want a completely precise version of everything I'm going to say, then take a look at the paper. Uh, there's, a, there's a precise version written down there. Okay, so in the fully permissionless setting, uh, without resource restrictions yet, okay, so because of a potentially, potentially infinite set of players, P, each player uh, in that set is allocated a non-empty and potentially infinite set of identifiers. Again, you can think of those identifiers as an arbitrarily large pre-generated set of public keys for which P knows the corresponding private key. Okay, and a player can use his identifiers to create an arbitrarily large number of symbols. Identifier sets are disjoint, okay? So intuitively, no, uh, no player knows the private keys that are held by other players, okay? although we allow uh, collaboration between Byzantine players. Uh, as a standard, so we're going to assume time is divided into discrete time slots, uh, time starting at one and so on, okay? 
And now we're going to suppose that each player may be active or inactive at each time slot. If a player is inactive, that means that they don't receive many messages, they don't send any messages, they make no state transitions. If a player is active, okay, then they can send and receive messages, and if they're honest, they'll be carrying out the, the, the protocol instructions as they're supposed to. Again, by just a little bit of uh, terminology, so by a player allocation, we mean a function specifying the identifier set for each player and the time slots at which they're active. Okay, and so far, I haven't said very much about what's known to the protocol. That's obviously very important here. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> what we have is that this is the, the player set and the player allocation are unknown. Okay, so this is just a slightly more precise way of introducing those, those three challenges that I uh, described on the previous slide. Okay, so I get rid of my face, you can see the slide. <clears throat> uh, so what I haven't talked about there yet <laughs> is uh, the means of, of communication. So generally in the permission setting, of course, we consider <clears throat> like private channels as a channel between each pair of participants. In the permission setting, that doesn't really make sense, right? Because if you don't know how, who's out there, how can you have private channels to them? So there are various different approaches you can take here. The approach we take is to have a dissemination model. So we allow that players can just disseminate messages to all. Okay, uh, and then um, the, the time it takes to arrive might depend on uh, the particular setting you're operating in, the, the synchronous or the partially synchronous setting. So that's uh, that's how we do it. There are, you know, there are various other ways uh, you could approach things here. You could allow that you know you, you can disseminate messages to all, and then uh, you know once you learn the, <coughs> that another player is there, then you can send them private messages. Okay, there, there are various different possibilities. Um, I don't need to worry about it too much because none, none of the results I talk about today will be overly sensitive to the way we set things up then. Okay. Okay, so for now, we're just considering a, a dissemination model. Um, <clears throat> we want to consider uh, sort of analogs of the synchronous and partially synchronous settings. Basically, we, we want to work in the standard synchronous and partially synchronous settings, but we have to adjust the definitions to make, uh, to make sense in a, in, in, a, in a scenario where players might not always be active. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to do next is just to go through uh, sort of an obvious way of modifying the definitions of the synchronous and partially synchronous models so that they make sense in this new context where players might not always be active. Okay. And again, uh, you know, there, there may be uh, a number of decisions to be made here. I mean, you, know, you can write down potentially slightly different versions of these definitions, but I don't want you to worry too much about that. Nothing I talk about today will be sort of massively sensitive to the way in which we write down these definitions. Generally, what we've done, we're writing down these definitions in such a way as to make our impossibility results as strong as possible. Okay, okay so uh, what do we mean by the synchronous setting in a, in, in a context where players might be active and uh, certain or inactive at certain time slots? Uh, so here's an obvious way of writing down the definition. So in the synchronous model, we suppose there exists some known delta, some known bound delta, such that if P disseminates the message M at T, and then some other player P prime is active at T prime, greater than equal to T plus delta, then P receives that dissemination at a time slot less than or equal to T prime. Okay, obviously you can't receive messages if you're not active. Okay, so that's the synchronous model, and then um, we make a, a similar adaptation for the partially synchronous model. So in the partially synchronous model, there exists some known delta and some unknown time slot GST, as always. And it says here GST is less than equal to D. D here is just a duration. That's the number of time slots. Don't worry too much about that. So generally, we'll, we'll, we'll imagine that D is infinity. We'll, right, we'll consider infinite executions. Okay, so now there exists some known delta, some unknown time slot GST. So, so if P disseminates a message M at T, and if P prime uh, is active at T prime, greater than equal to a maximum of GST uh, and T plus delta, then P prime receives that dis determination at a time slot less than or equal to T. Okay, um, so yeah, so the, the that gives us a, a, well, a, a vaguely uh, precise version of the fully permissionless setting without resource restrictions yet. As I say, if you want to see a complete precise version, then, then please do look at the paper. The next thing we want to do is to sketch a, a proof that consensus would be possible in that setting. Uh, in order to do that, though, we need to make precise what we mean by consensus. There are various different versions of consensus. In particular, we want to define what we mean by Byzantine agreement. And again, we have to you know, pay attention because we have to make sure the definition makes sense in a context where players might not be active. Okay. 
So here's what we mean by Byzantine agreement in a context where players may not be active. Okay, so suppose we, uh, we're running an infinite execution. Okay, duration is infinite. And each player is given an input in 0, 1. Well, then we say that a deterministic protocol solves Byzantine agreement if for every protocol execution consistent with the setting there exists a time, some time slot T star, let's say, for which the following three conditions are satisfied. Okay, so first of all, termination. So all honest players active at any time slot greater than to T star terminate and give an output in 0, 1. Okay, so that's basically the same as your standard version of termination, but now modified to deal with the fact that players might not be active uh, at certain time slots and therefore can't be required to terminate. Right? You can't require players to terminate unless they're active. Okay, that's termination, and then agreement and validity are just as standard. Okay, so agreement, just the, 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 the same as, as ever. All honest players, the output, give the same output. <clears throat> and validity, and again, there are various different versions of validity, but we'll, we'll fix a particular one. So if all players are given the same input i, then every honest player that outputs gives i as their output. Okay, and then, so here then is the proper position. Uh, as I say, so earlier on, I you know the, the, the definition of the, the fully permissionless setting without resources restrictions that I've sort of sketched there is not completely precise. Basically, the idea is I've given you... Uh, uh, hopefully enough precision that the the, the the proof sketch that we'll go through now will seem highly plausible. Okay. okay, so here first of all though is the proposition. Okay, so consider the fully permissionless setting without resources yet. And suppose that the player set is finite. For every row greater than zero, no protocol source by Zanti agreement when up to a row fraction the players may be by Zanti. Okay, so this result holds even in the synchronous setting with a known player set and with all players active at all time slots. Okay, so it's, it's, it's really, it's the possibility of Sybils that's driving the impossibility result here. Okay. Okay, so that's the, uh, that's the proposition. In the next video, what we're going to do is sketch a, a proof of the proposition. Okay, so I'll see you there.